So hello and welcome to the End User Partner Summit. And this is a panel that will try to center on strategy and vision and how to best navigate and contribute to the cloud native ecosystem as an end user. Today, we have an incredible lineup of panelists from the CNCF and TOC leadership, including Chris Anijic, Liz Rice, and Ricardo Rocha. This panel pretty much is hosted by myself and Cheryl Hyung, and we are both leading the end user community, which is a venture neutral group of more than 140 organizations that use cloud native technologies to build and distribute their services. Just as a reminder, we are moderating this panel in Zoom with questions mainly from the end user attendees. Um, additionally, we will aim to stream this on YouTube and LinkedIn and hopefully we'll go live throughout the event. Um, so if there's any questions, please do put them in the Zoom chat or you can raise your hand and ask it um, live if you choose so. Before we dive into the questions, could I ask everyone to introduce themselves and maybe we could start with Chris. Hey everyone, my name is uh, Chris Anizik. I have the fun job of serving as CTO of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and I'm basically been here since uh, day zero. I'm um, excited to have an opportunity to talk a little bit about the history and how end users have been involved uh, since the beginning. Liz, would you like to go next? Sure, hi, my name is Liz Rice. I am Chief Open Source Officer at iSurveillance and I'm here in my role as Chair of the Technical Oversight Committee for the CNCF. And Ricardo, could you go next as well? Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Ricardo. I'm a computing engineer at CERN. I work in the CERN cloud team. I'm also um, a TOC member where I represent the end user community. So happy to be here. Awesome. So we have a set of questions that we'd like to, to ask for our panelists. Again, if you have any questions for the uh, CNCF leadership team or the TOC uh, members do ask them in the Zoom. And I'll let Cheryl to kick start with the questions. Cool. Um, hey folks, so my name is Cheryl Hung. I think I know most of you already, but it is awesome to see you all again. So I wanna start off with a question to Chris. So the end user community steers the growth of the cloud native landscape by integrating tools within their organizations and providing feedback to the projects. Can you outline how the end user community integrates with the wider system, ecosystem, including projects, SIGs, and the TOC? Sure. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my kind of introduction, end users have been involved with CNCF uh, since the beginning. You know, we deliberately, as we set up the organization, we kind of jokingly refer to there's kind of three three pillars to the you know you know circus we have at CNCF. There's the traditional. Um, you know, governing board, which is boring, handles the business decisions, budget. We have the TOC, which um, Liz and Ricardo are part of, that kind of handles the technical decisions. And kind of the final pillar has been the end user uh, community. And, you know, we deliberately wanted to make sure that we were not an organization, you know, driven by vendors. And so when we set up the end user community, we ensured that they would have a role in different parts of the organization. Uh, initially, they had a seat on the TOC. We now have two end user reps uh, on, on, on the TOC representing end user uh, interests. Uh, and, you know, there's kind of multiple ways uh, end users get involved, you know, sometimes they could simply just be, you know, passive looking to kind of learn, you know, from each other uh, through presentations that we do with the end user group, uh, you know, whether it's learning from another company, how do they do developer experience, how do they, you know, potentially roll out service messages, service meshes. Um, other end users tend to be a little bit more, um, you know, uh, active and contributing projects. For example, um, you know, uh, Capital One recently contributed Cloud Custodian the CNCF. And for Capital One, they're an organization that essentially is going through their own transformation, right? So they started out as a bank, uh, you know, outsourced a lot of their engineering and services. Then they decided, wait a minute, we need to be uh, a little bit more progressive and actually own some of our engineering. And so they brought that in house and they started to develop software on their own, open sourcing things, sharing things uh, to kind of modernize how their uh, you know, bank was run. And so uh, they just started to contributing stuff and you know, sharing their lessons with the end user community. We have other organizations you know, like Spotify, which you know, have done similar things uh, where they've open sourced backstage uh, to CNCF that kind of describes how internally they've done you know, developer 
uh, you know, experience and kind of managing all the services internally. And they've decided to share that with the world to learn from each other. So I think there's, there's kind of multiple avenues for end users to get involved, whether you could just simply be uh, a passive listener and just learn from everyone. But ideally, you would hopefully contribute some of your lessons learned within your organization. But we essentially don't uh, discriminate in one form or another. We allow end users from all different kind of uh, walks in life and uh, part of and wherever they are as part of their cloud native journey to, to participate. That was an amazing introduction, actually. Thank you for sharing your your vision yeah. of how the end users are centered within the community. Um, maybe I could I would like, maybe I could just yeah. add a quick um, note <laughs> to that um, because we've seen increasing numbers of projects coming from end user organizations. Like Chris mentioned, Capital yep. One, Spotify. Yep. There's there's several examples, and I think it's really indicative of how. It, there are still some problems to be solved in making it really easy to build and ship and deploy cloud native applications. You know, a lot of the pieces are in place, but there are still things that can be improved. And in many of these examples, end user organizations are the people who are rubbing up against those problems and they're in the best place to innovate with those problems. Um, so it's really great to see, you know, those problems being identified and solutions being identified and brought back to the community. It's really, you know, valuable input from, you know, building above those kind of core components like Kubernetes to getting closer to the real problems that developers are hitting day to day. Yeah, I think historically, you know, end users have not really been involved with, you know, a lot of open sourcing and so on. They were consumers. And I think especially in the last decade, we've seen that switch from, it's not only the, the innovation is not only coming from the vendors, it's coming from end users hitting problems at scale or with vendor solutions. And they've been a little bit more progressive these days and sharing some of those publicly. You know, I remember when I started my career, banks, like it was even impossible to do stuff like almost outside the firewall of a bank. And now you're seeing banks like Bloomberg and others, you know, Fidelity, you know, Capital One sharing these things, working in the open. So it's just kind of nice to see this shift uh, happen in the industry. Yeah, there was a, uh, hey everyone, Priyanka here. <laughs> um, uh, I mentioned this in one of my uh, keynotes at last year's KubeCon, Cloud Native Cons, is we're seeing this virtuous cycle of innovation where uh, end users are coming in and being welcomed into uh, the Cloud Native ecosystem. They're trying out our technologies, using them, battle testing them, and push, putting as much pressure as possible, and then finding areas where they could bring something new, and that's where end user projects are born then they donate those, then they become even a deeper part of the ecosystem. Then they influence new product creation from the vendors. And so the cycle kind of goes in a really positive way. And I think being end user driven open source at CNCF has been super useful for everyone involved because of that virtuous cycle. These were actually great answers. And thank you for joining us, Priyanka. Um, great to have uh, to have you as well here. Hi, um, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like to focus a bit more on uh, the role of the TOCs and how this can actually impact the growth of the end user community and make it easier for the end user community to be um, to be involved. So, I have a question uh, more for Feliz and Ricardo. Last um, year, the TOC is actually focused on streamlining the sandbox entry process for the projects. And now the TOCs are looking to revise the incubation criteria and guidelines for, um, again, the incubation projects. Now, would you be able to talk us through some of the motivations behind those changes and how exactly it could potentially uh, make it easier for the end users to contribute back to the community? Yeah, I, I could start with this. So the sandbox is, it, relatively new we've probably had it now for two or three years maybe three years but uh, it, it wasn't part of the original um uh, the original model that we had but we realized that there were there was demand for uh, a, a place for experimentation and projects where people wanted to collaborate they didn't necessarily have a home that they could do that in and we wanted to be able to offer that so the sandbox was really always intended to be a space for experimentation. And over time, we kind of tweaked a bit what the definition of 
sandbox really means like how good does a project need to be to get into the sandbox the answer is actually the bar is really very low but one of the things that we did trying to streamline the process was clarify what we're looking for in a sandbox project and clarify the extent to which it really is experimental we're not really making any claims at all about how good a project something is if it's in sandbox level um, but we we streamline that so we've got a much more efficient process so that if you do have a project and you want it to sort of start benefiting particularly from the collaborative nature of cncf sandbox projects don't get any marketing push but they do get a lot of the um ability to well they're neutrally owned for a start and it's a good starting point to jump off from into incubation incubation has always been the really hard bar to get past you have to be you know demonstrably cloud native we do a lot of due diligence around um, the governance of the project the technology in the project whether people are genuinely using it in you know, production cases incubation is still not fully de-risked but we do expect a project to be on a pretty solid path and uh we we're working on kind of streamlining that not to change the um, the bar, the, the definition will um, essentially remain the same, but some of the ways in which we go about um, collecting that information for due diligence, we realized we could rationalize that. We're currently uh, getting lots of help from uh, what are currently called the SIGs, the special interest groups. They're gonna be renamed to uh, technology advisory groups just to avoid confusion. Um, they're helping us with that due diligence and we we kind of needed to clarify more the boundaries between what we're expecting the 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 SIGs the tags to do and what the TOC uh, needs in order to make the judgment and essentially just try and streamline the efficiency of that process make things much more sort of straightforward so that a project you know it, it does take there's a significant amount of work goes into due diligence so it is still going to take weeks but we want to get it more into the kind of scope of a small number of months rather than a, a giant six month, eight month process. Um, Ricardo, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, would, I think that that's a very good uh, description. Uh, I, one of the things that is very good in this area is that uh, all this uh, idea of sandbox incubation and eventually graduation gives a really good feeling about the project to the end users as well. Um, it's quite important to have the, as much as possible in, in this kind of heterogeneous environment with uh, many different projects doing different things, but to have some, some nice criteria where things move towards this process. And then as an end user, people can, can just uh, rely a bit on this. Uh, there's a lot more things like the technology radars where where more feedback will be uh, uh, very useful also for people to make their choices. But to having this uh, this bar that projects have to go through and some sort of strict uh, criteria they have to comply to, it's it's quite useful for for end users. I think it's a, it's a, it's a work that is really valuable for for everyone. Cool. I'd love to ask Ricardo actually a little bit more about your role in particular because you are one of the end user representatives on the TOC. So we now have four out of 11 TOC members from end user organizations like Apple and Spotify and yourself from CERN. So what do you see as your role and responsibility? And maybe even you can talk about why you are interested in being on the TOC. Yeah, so I, I think the the one of the interests of being in the TOC is really to help the community like we, we get uh, every end user gets a lot back and uh, it's uh, it's a kind of our responsibility also to, to give as much as possible uh, back to the community. Uh, I think the responsibilities are are similar to other members, just uh, the point of view is, is kind of different. Um, we participate more on the end user uh, gatherings um, and we hear what other people are, are uh, requirements and what their feelings are um, in the different areas. And our role is really to give uh, this input when when the the TOC has to make decisions or or do some sort of due diligence to help out in this area because we we are more uh, probably closer to other end users and have a good feeling of uh, what what um, 
what different projects are capable and how people feel about them. Well, one thing that I also had the motivation to join the TUC is that because uh, we are kind of in the research side and we've seen, like we were talking about how the community has been evol evolving. One thing that also happens is that the end users get together themselves if the, like the mainstream uh, requirements are not uh, like enough for their needs. And this happens in the research community. So we formed this CNCF um, uh, research user group um, where we try to accommodate uh, more specific requirements from the research community. So uh, also one, one idea is to, to um, make those requirements more visible uh, in, in the ecosystem. Uh, because I think eventually everyone will need them, but maybe maybe the research community can can be the one that pushes them forward uh, first. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that it's really important to bring out the viewpoints from the end users and expose that to the TOC so that you get a different view of the problems that are coming direct from end users. And the research user group that um, Ricardo, you mentioned, is a great example of that. And actually Ricardo also chairs, he's too modest to mention this, but he also chairs that group. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful for everything that you do, Ricardo, for this community. Thank you. Yeah, but I, I stress again that this is, a, the, the, the good thing is that it's really a vibrant community where these things happen by themselves. Uh, the end user group, again, uh, the research user group is a very good example that just came up out of uh, KubeCon and people getting together over lunch and, uh, and then forming this. Yeah. I actually couldn't agree more. It's great to see so it's like such a good representation of end users in the TOCs as well and in the community. So I'm definitely looking forward to, to see how far it actually gets us. Um, I've actually, I have a question for Priyanka mainly. I may, actually, she touched upon uh, this earlier. During the, your keynote at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe in 2020, you have uh, one of your key messages have, has been end user driven open source. Now, would you be able to expand a bit more on that, Priyanka? And what do you think is the, the nucleus of the end user community and how it actually can shape the overall ecosystem? Yes, absolutely. So, end user driven open source, that is, has truly become our. Um, a line that we in this foundation identify ourselves with. It's because of all that you have heard right now, right? That um, by having um, end users participating in our technical oversight committee, which is truly our, uh, you know, a North Star body and having folks like Ricardo participate in it, you bring in this new perspective. I think uh, referring back to what Chris was saying, this is a big change from how things used to be. Um, by encouraging end users to be part of our uh, community and ecosystem, not just as consumers, but evaluators, feedback givers by creators of technology, we've changed the way um, open source has been innovating. And not to say this wasn't happening before, but of course there's been innovation from all kinds of companies, but by a focus on uh, end users, I think the CNCF Cloud Native Computing Foundation has institutionalized, has set in stone that these engagements with end users will always happen. Their point of view will always be front and center. And uh, that to my mind is end user driven open source. It's actually very similar for any folks here in the audience who you know, tried their hand at startups and uh, product development. The whole idea, right, is customer driven development or user driven development. That's kind of what we're bringing to open source with end user driven open source here at CNCF. Nice stuff. I mean, I think I definitely agree. Of course, I definitely agree with, um, <laughs> with this viewpoint. Um, Liz, so let me direct the next question to you. At the last KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, you presented some predictions from the TOC and what projects you are seeing coming out. And I believe you're doing the same again for this set of keynotes. So maybe you can give us a bit of sneak peek about what you see is coming next. Yeah, so um, I don't want to steal too much thunder from my own keynote, but <laughs> uh, but what, what I've uh, what I've done with that one is revisit those original predictions, and um, it, it's always a little bit hard to tell whether it 
kind of become self-fulfilling because we've said we think this is these are interesting areas but we have seen projects particularly in the sandbox in all the five areas that we identified last time in particular around the whole developer experience and operator experience um side of things so um our toc colleague harry is also going to be taking part of that keynote and expanding a bit on some of the interesting changes that we're seeing in DevX and OpEx. Um, and then we have got a few more um, thoughts around, I mean, I think those those five areas we previously um, discussed, it was Kubernetes on the edge, it was chaos engineering, DevX, OpEx, Wasm and eBPF, and one more, help me, Chris. <laughs> I believe it was oh. chaos engineering. Oh, service mesh was the other one. Chaos, I said, service mesh was the, the fifth one. So I think those are all still areas where we're continuing to see innovation and consolidation. Um, it, a couple of other things that we've uh, highlighted. One is that multi-cloud is real. Uh, you know, I remember sort of two or three years ago, people saying, oh, you know, cluster, it was all about multi-cluster. And it, it wasn't quite such a real thing back then. But now, you know, it is, It is. you know, it'd be really interesting to get a show of hands from folks on this call, how many of you are actually engaged in multi-cloud? You know, I think um, both in terms of multiple public clouds, but also the hybrid cloud split between um you know, on-prem and public cloud, we're seeing some real solutions related to, to that. And uh, I, I feel like that's become, um, you know, a real area of interest. And another one that I remember is um, AI. You know, it's it, we're seeing, it makes a lot of sense that people are using the cloud, when they're renting cloud resources to do machine learning, training, and, uh, you know, building their models because they need giant amounts of compute resources to do that. So it's kind of inevitable that we're going to see more innovation, making machine learning and AI solutions easier to manage on the cloud. And that feels like a whole sort of new, quite big expansion area for cloud native. And I'd be really interested to hear other people's opinions on that. Uh, uh, you know, on, on whether that's also impacting on their lives. Chris is saying EVPF, obviously. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Staring at your shirt. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I think, I think uh, the only thing I would add to that is seeing Kubernetes used as more as kind of like, let's call it a cross cloud control plane and running more workloads than are just containers, right? You know, Kubernetes may have, started as uh, purely focused on containers, but we're seeing it, you know, stretch to running, you know, VMs, AI based workloads, uh, orchestrating cloud, you know, based services, I think, you know, people are just finding it useful as uh, a, a, a control plane uh, <laughs> that could handle, you know, different types uh, of workloads, because at the end of the day, you're orchestrating things across different uh, machines and services. One thing I can say, I'm definitely looking forward for the keynotes tomorrow. So learning a bit more of these predictions um, within the cloud native ecosystem. We actually have a question from our end users and I'm gonna uh, read it out now. So the question is coming from Sergio and he is asking that now we are in an open source cold war where open source tech pioneers like Elasticsearch feel they need to change the open source licenses. How is CNCF mediating this conflict what should we do as end users and what we need to expect in the future? So would anyone like to get a start I'll, this question? I'll, I'll start first. So, you know, one of the premises of CNCF was always to allow uh, permissive innovation, right? You know, we license all of our stuff under uh, Apache, you know, 2.0, which basically allows end users, vendors, everyone to build innovative solutions on top of, uh, you know, these wonderful projects without worrying too much um, you know, about any crazy license obligations outside of attribution. So that's always been kind of how we've uh, structured the organization and, and pushed ourselves towards basically uh, permissive and permissionless, basically, in, in innovation. Um, you know, there's obviously some vendors out there that, um, you know, have different uh, attitudes and approaches uh, to this based on whether, you know, 
you know, changes in business models or, you know, however they're kind of structured. Uh, I don't really see CNCF as an organization to kind of like, you know, mediate these things, you know, from our perspective, we really want to listen to our end users. And, you know, if our vendors or end users have issue with things, we could always, you know, collaborate on potentially a solution to work around these things. But in general, like, I don't really see CNCF as a mediator here. These are organizations making these decisions based on, you know, business needs or other influences. Uh, the only thing that uh, on a personal level bothers me is when you have you know, companies that essentially uh, free ride on the permissive commons, you know, using a license like AGP or sorry, Apache, and then changing to a more restrictive license that just personally uh, pisses me off uh, a little bit because it does cause a little consternation uh, in the ecosystem. And it does cause confusion when it comes to adoption uh, on, on the product side. But in general, uh, CNCF's role is not to be a mediator. We listen to our end users and vendors to kind of work um, you know, with, uh, you know, what, what happens uh, in, in the ecosystem. So hopefully that uh, answers your question, uh, Sergio. I could add in a, 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 a sort of very much echoing that sentiment. I think we have seen how successful this organization has been based on Apache licenses. You know, permissive licenses have allowed such great innovation and such great collaboration. And there are plenty of vendors, vendors surrounding this ecosystem who are managing to build successful businesses. You know, it, some of it open source, some of it proprietary. It, it feels like the permissive licensing at the heart of the core projects feels to me like that's been part of the reason for our success. So I hope it continues. And I hope that the trend to continuing with permissive licenses continues for a long time to come. Yeah, Thank maybe. you for tackling this. Uh, yeah, tough question. Yeah, I was just going to say maybe maybe to add a, a bit to that is just to reinforce here is I, I think the one worry here is that um, the communities themselves change. Uh, like like it was being said that this, this has been extremely successful in not only making open source uh, uh, popular but also some companies that traditionally were not so keen on open source actually changed their minds uh, and have been uh, highly participative. So yeah, one of the worries is that we kind of go back in time a bit. So let's see how it, how it continues. Amazing. Um, so going next again, if you have any questions, please ask them. Um, otherwise, I would like to move with the next question, which focuses a bit more again on KubeCon and some of the main themes that we'd like to or we see emerging. Um, so are there any themes at the moment that you see kind of highlighted or any talks, keynotes um, that you'd recommend for our end users to attend? Um, I can start that one off. Um, you know, this KubeCon, CloudNativeCon, I think is a manifestation of all of that this community has done together in the last greater than one year. We have, all of you, all of us, we, have worked through some incredible challenges. We've had different geographical regions experiencing turmoil at different points of time. And right now our, our, our hearts go out to what's happening in India and in Brazil, even in parts of Canada, like so many parts of the globe are still suffering. But what this community has done is that it's kept moving forward together. And that you see is the tagline for the show. And it's very intentional because through, I, I touch on this a little bit in my keynote tomorrow, but through this whole time, Cloud Native has, the community has kept shipping at a great pace. Don't know what that says, but we have been productive. Um, people have really come together and supported each other. I, you know, if I'm feeling down, I literally just needed to go tweet and someone would reply and have encouraging words, have supportive words. And I've seen that happen, not just for me, but for others with each other. Um, and I think we've been very resilient in this time because we are made of a global force. We're so many different kinds of people coming together and our mission is the same. We want cloud native to be ubiquitous. We're on this path of progress that is paved by our diversity, by our resilience, by our solidarity. So you will see that reflected everywhere in KubeCon this whole week. Uh, one of the keynotes that's really exciting is by Peloton and it's on the agenda, you'll see. 
they talk about how they've navigated through the pandemic, gone fully cloud native and all the cool things that have happened for them. And they, by the way, are not an anomaly. There are so many companies out there who've completely ramped up engineering workforces during the pandemic as every company has become a digital company with like much faster speed. And so many folks have doubled down on cloud native. You'll see a lot of that in the various talks that really cloud native has become the building block of hu the human experience in the pandemic. And I think that sets us up for success in the future. Uh, as Liz said, there's so many areas where we are, you know, in the predictions that we're going to be critical in AI being a big one. And AI ML is taking a bigger and bigger role in society just because of all the information that we have now. So you'll hear stories about all of that. And I think most of all, you'll meet people, you'll hang out with folks, not quite the same as in person, but it is definitely, I think, a bigger crowd to like, we just have, we have more than 25,000 people attending the show. And you have lots of friends to make, lots of things to learn, lots to give back. And I hope you enjoy it. Amazing. And let me follow up on the last line that you said, Priyanka, about giving back. So what do you think are the best ways that end users can get involved and contribute back to the ecosystem? I might open up the same to Liz, Ricardo, Chris. For sure. I mean, there, you end users, you are the heart and soul of what we are doing. We are building for you, for your success. So any minute you're able to spend with us is a minute well spent and one that we value. So the simplest thing, enjoy the KubeCons, show up, learn, and take what you learn back to your uh, organizations. From there, I mean, I highly encourage attending the maintainer office hours, learning from them and getting plugged in on their point of view uh, about a project that you care about. Um, as you get deep, uh, more involved, or if you want some guidance as you get more involved, I highly, highly recommend the end user ecosystem that Cheryl and Katie run so effectively. I think, um, you know, it's, it's a great way to be in a part of a community where it's everyone just it going through very similar on the same path to progress as you are. And you can have clear, um, candid conversations about what's working for folks, what's not working for folks. And uh, I, I've heard, you know, I was actually reading this book about habit making. And uh, in some ways, we're all changing our cultures and the way we, our old habits when we go cloud native. And one of the things the habit making book said was that the best way to ensure a habit sticks is to do it in a community. And this can be that community for you, your accountability buddies. So come to the end user ecosystem, come to that community. And I think you will find uh, that you accelerate your path to cloud native, which ultimately is to delight your end users. Um, I think you can take a, as deep or as light of a role as you want. Ricardo here is a great example uh, of a, taking a deep role and you know, having a stance giving feedback to projects, uh, but really it's whatever you can spare is more than welcome. And you are always welcome. Amazing. Um, Liz, Ricardo, Chris. Yeah, I, I can add a couple of things. Um, so I think one thing when we talk about contributions, particularly in the you know world of open source, it, it definitely isn't all about code contributions. Code contributions are wonderful, but um, as end users, you're also having experience of using these projects. And I'm sure that every project out there is um, very keen to learn from your experiences and you know things like raising issues, letting uh, maintainers know about any issues that you're having or, or scale problems or, or whatever, you know, things good or bad, feedback on how the project's working for, for you in your real life situations is hugely valuable to um, existing project maintainers. Uh, the other thing I would mention is the what's currently called CNCF SIGs. They're going to be renamed to, to technology advisory groups or TAGs. Um, those groups, uh, they kind of sit under the TOC that Ricardo and I are on, and they are specialist, you know, areas of, of, of knowledge and experience. And we lean on those groups for 
um, advice to us and also advice to the end user community. So if you have people in your organizations who are really involved in you know, security or observability or any of the, there's I think seven altogether, getting involved with those groups, sharing your experience, helping write white papers, helping us understand where things are confusing to people um, you know, joining the community. Those are really, really valuable and um, yeah, having having folks from end user organizations getting more involved in those technology advisory groups would be really valuable i guess to to kind of end uh, the the thought on this one is you know of all the kind of the companies I've, I've worked with on the end user side everyone has different problems some are a little bit more progressive than others and some are just like super early in the stage of their cloud native journey and sometimes they just have simple questions of like hey can you go talk to our legal team to explain open source or like hey you know how do you potentially you know contribute upstream without any you know ip concerns we are happy to work with end users from all different kind of uh, walks of life so don't be afraid to kind of reach out to um you know cncf staff to kind of help guide you uh you know on on your journey not everyone is uh, is as progressive as as others when it comes to uh open source and, and cloud native okay i can just build on that then and, and just add uh, um, Liz mentioned the uh, six there are also the end user groups uh, that uh, people can can reach out to and uh, it's a very good way to get introduced to, to other people using the same products I think one thing Liz mentioned which is uh, giving feedback to the project themselves is, is critical uh, this is something that always has a, a very good reaction from from the projects themselves and then maybe I'll, I'll just mention also this uh, technology radars uh, that uh, CNCF runs uh, often. These are also very valuable. Uh, there are reports being published in different areas regularly by Cheryl and, and uh, CNCF end user uh, end users. So th this is this is extremely good. If you can provide feedback on those, uh, it's always very welcome. Uh, and then in the in KubeCon, I think it's a, it's a very good very good uh, opportunity to to reach out to people. Uh, there's very relaxed sessions. I, I remember in the last KubeCon, I think also Katie and Cheryl were, were there. We ended up in a session uh, learning how to juggle and uh, chatting with uh, like random people. And I, I know that uh, after that, I at least kept contact with two or three that uh, we, we followed up on, on things that we share. And uh, we, it's, it's a very good way to be introduced to the community as well. It's absolutely fantastic. So many ways to contribute as an end user. So I hope all of the attendees will make the best use of this, uh, these channels and these opportunities. I know we're kind of drawing close uh, to the end of our panel. However, we still have one question from our end users and this is directed to Chris. And uh, it sounds like this, Chris, you've mentioned that there would be more guidance from the CNCF on projects moving to AGPL like Minio, Grafana Labs, et cetera. So AGPL is not um, is not on the allow list for dependencies at the moment. Is that correct? Would you be able to expand on this? Yeah, no, I mean, we have a very, you know, as I mentioned before, CNCF is all about kind of permissive uh, innovation uh, and so on. So our allow list of, of licenses that projects can depend on are generally all permissive licenses like MIT, other Apache things, BSD and so so on. Uh, AGPL is definitely a more restrictive license, so it is not allowed. Um, as I mentioned before, there's been a trend in the industry to kind of change, uh, you know, uh, let, let's call it free riding on the permissive commons and changing from something like an Apache to AGPL. And so some of our projects are affected by this. We recently posted some guidance on the found, CNCF Foundation GitHub repo for our projects uh, that um, we will be publicizing more next week, but we're all a little bit busy at KubeCon. But if you're interested in kind of reading the full details, um, that link I posted in the chat uh, from the foundation repo kind of gives a set three recommendations of projects, uh, what they could do. It could be as simple as uh, using the old release uh, or getting together with partners and peers in industry and maybe forking that, you know, that old release and maintaining it uh, in open. So there's a different set of recommendations for folks and we plan to talk, it out, talk about it more uh, after KubeCon next week. Awesome, thank you for responding to this one. Um, so pretty much we were close to, to the end of our panel. Are there any other remarks, any other uh, suggestions, recommendations for our end users and how they can make the best of KubeCon? Anyone from the panel would like to take this one? Um, I just wanted to add one piece, uh, which is that 
in that spirit of being a diverse um, ecosystem of having diversity powered resilience, we innovated on the KubeCon Cloud Native Con um, schedule as well. And two things that are new this time are a business value subtract, which has a few talks around literally Cloud Native 101 definitions, how to sell open source internally, things like that. So if you have colleagues in your company who you would really think would benefit from this and would make your job easier, feel free to send them that way. That way they are coming into this part of the ecosystem with us and um, will support you in your journey. The second piece that we've added is for learners and students uh, around the world. We've often heard that uh, even our 101 content can be advanced for someone who um, is a learner or a student and may not have real time experience with uh, large production systems. So if you know anyone like that or on your teams or in your life, uh, please feel free to send them this way too, because we want to start uh, supporting the, that path to progress that people make from as early as possible uh, and figured that a student subtract would be valuable. And if people want to find any of these sessions, just go on the schedule and click on student track or uh, business value, and you will have access to talks that we recommend for those experience levels. So just thought I'd mention that since that's something completely new. Oh, and hallway track. Everybody should hang out there all the time. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff happening. And that is where you will hear when I'm doing happy hours for the community tomorrow and the day after. So join in, we'll just be having fun, talk, talking, playing music, games, just a chill time for all. And of course, you're welcome to bring a beverage. Thank you for these insights, Priyanka. Anything from Liz, Ricardo, Chris, any last remarks? I think I would just say we really, really do value input from the end user community, things that are impacting you, um, you know, some of the things that have come up in the discussions earlier about things like licenses. We, you know, we'd love to hear what the the real impact of this is uh, for, you know, for end users who are dealing with stuff like that on the, you know, on the coal face as it were. So uh, your input is hugely valuable. Thank you. Oh, and get ready. Oh, sorry, Chris. <laughs> you were like, go ahead. Then I'll yeah, no, I, I was going to say, you know, you know, you know, Give us feedback how we can improve KubeCon in this event. We primarily put on KubeCon for our end user community, uh, even though it may not be obvious, we do put a lot of planning to make sure end users are happy with it. So please offer us feedback and hopefully we'll be able to all see each other physically in, in Los Angeles uh, in, uh, I guess that's four months or so from actually a little bit more than that in October. Uh, so uh, other than that, yeah, give us feedback. We'd always want to improve and iterate on making KubeCon a better experience uh, for all, but hopefully this is my one of my last virtual uh, events. <laughs> that is exactly what I was going to say. Fingers crossed, last virtual only event. Um, plan for uh, LA in, in October. Uh, hopefully, you know, many regions around the world will be able to travel. Um, and I was just thinking as we were talking here, right? As we would say things, it's like, I have no idea if that landed with this audience. <laughs> Do people think this was valuable or not? It's like, you know, you don't know what the reaction is. And I, I can't wait to be in a room with you all where we'll be talking rather than us broadcasting to you. So cannot wait. Mark your calendars October 11 to 15. See you then. Amazing. Ricardo, would you like to add anything? I would well? just say the same. I, I hope uh, we can we can meet each other soon uh, in person. Uh, this this cons are very valuable, but uh, but the in person ones are even more. So I hope the next one will be when we get back to to being able to talk to each other in person. Looking forward. Oh, by the way, uh, right after the event, you will get an email about where KubeCon Cloud Native Con EU twenty two is happening. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Definitely looking for in-person events and definitely looking forward for KubeCon Europe next year already. This one is not finished, but I'm already looking forward for the next <laughs> one. Um, thank you very much for uh, 
all of our panelists and all of our attendees at the End User Partner Summit and all of your questions. It was great to see what the actual end users are um, caring to talk more about and explore. We are excited to see how the end users are going to be shaping the future of cloud native ecosystem. And more, more than anything, we're looking how the end user community is going to contribute back. And we're looking more um, forward to, to those contributions as well. Well, I have one more thing to add as well. So if you want to learn a little bit more about your membership with CNCF and what you can do, what you can get out of it, then please come and join the end user lounge, the benefits edition, which is going to run tomorrow at 3.30 CEST. So we'll talk a little bit about the Linux Foundation training benefits you get, the branding opportunities, that help, how that helps you with your recruiting, um, and then how to collaborate with other members of the end user community as well. So thank you so much and have a fantastic KubeCon. Thank you. Thank you.